Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'd like to welcome all of you to today's presentation on curing with sound. Today, we'll hear from Dr. Neil Cassell, chairman of the Focused Ultrasound Foundation. He'll discuss our view of focused ultrasound technology and the role of the foundation in advancing the field. Before we get started, just a few technical items. If your connection is lost, please simply log in again through the link you received when you registered. And you will receive a link to a recording of the webinar as well. If you'd like to ask a question, please submit it via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we'll collect these questions until the Q&A period at the end of the presentation. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Neil Cassell. Neil, the floor is yours. Thank you, and thank all of you for joining with us this afternoon. On behalf of the entire Focused Ultrasound Foundation family, I hope that you're staying safe and healthy while we work through this pandemic. So 14 years ago or so, when we first got involved with Focused Ultrasound, we had this audacious or bold or somewhat crazy idea that we were going to improve the lives of millions of people around the world with a wide variety of serious medical disorders by facilitating or creating a revolution, a revolution in therapy using focused ultrasound. And much to our astonishment, this revolution has actually begun and we're going to share our perspective. So focused ultrasound is the most powerful sound you will never hear, but it's a sound that someday could save your life. What if we could treat a patient with a malignant brain tumor, glioblastoma, like John McCain, using focused ultrasound instead of, or in addition to surgery, radiation therapy, and chemotherapy, and thereby extend his life from one to perhaps five years. Now that sounds like science fiction, like Star Wars, but it's very much rooted in reality. So focused ultrasound is an early stage, totally non-invasive therapeutic technology that is a game-changing, highly, highly disruptive alternative or complement to surgery and radiation, a new way of delivering drugs, and a way of stimulating the body's immune system to cancer. Being outpatient, being non-invasive, it can be performed on an outpatient basis with no incisions and less pain, decreased complications such as infection and hemorrhage and collateral tissue damage, leading to more rapid recovery and improved outcomes at a lower cost. In its evolution, focused ultrasound is where magnetic resonance imaging was 35 years ago. At that time, essentially no one had heard of MR scanning. But today, everyone has either had an MR scan or certainly knows someone who's had an MR scan. And by all measures, MR scanning has revolutionized, revolutionized diagnosis and created a multi-billion dollar industry. In its evolution, focused ultrasound is where MR scanning was 30 or 35 years ago. It has been called medicine's best kept secret, but it's a big deal. It has the potential to revolutionize therapy to the same degree that MR scan revolutionized diagnosis and along the way to create a multi-billion dollar industry. And although in its, it's in its infancy, here's some examples to demonstrate that it's real today. So in the bottom pane, you can see the video of a 64 year old left-handed architect who's been afflicted by essential tremor, a cousin of Parkinson's disease. And you can see his attempts at drawing 
in the pane above, not good for an architect. So he was treated with focused ultrasound immediately before the treatment, an MR scan was performed. And that blue dot in the middle of the brain on the right side is the target of the abnormal nerve cells that are firing away uncontrollably, causing the shaking. He went into the focused ultrasound device. He received no drugs whatsoever. He was wide awake throughout the treatment. At the end, and the, the target was treated with 1,024 intersecting beams of ultrasound energy. At the completion of the treatment, his tremor was completely gone. Another MR scan was performed, which showed that the target had been totally obliterated. He could draw immediately for the first time in more than 10 years. And you can see in this video, three months later, he has absolutely no tremor. Now, it doesn't take an enormous leap of faith to appreciate that if there's a technology that can be used to treat something with a high degree of precision and accuracy in the middle of the brain through the intact skin and skull, that that's in an awake patient, that that same technology can be more readily used to treat things that are outside of the body like tumors of the breast or tumors in more forgiving locations like the liver. This is a young woman with a gigantic uterine fibroid, a benign tumor of the wall of her uterus, which are not uncommon in young women, but very, very unusual to achieve this size. You can imagine that this was interfering not only with her work life, but with her marital life. And she was offered hysterectomy, which was the standard of care, a big operation, five to seven days in the hospital, four to six weeks to recover, but most importantly, no more uterus, no more children. Instead, she chose focused ultrasound, which was an outpatient procedure. She went home the same day was back at work in two days. And here we see her nine months later after the tumor, which had been killed by the ultrasound energy, had been absorbed by her body. This is an MR scan of a 62-year-old surgeon in Milan, Italy. And in the second pane in the circle, you can see a very large pancreatic cancer, which had failed two very aggressive courses of chemotherapy. He was given two months, three months to live. And he was treated, you can see in the third pain, with focused ultrasound, that dark area, about 80% of the tumor was destroyed. And it was, he was treated just for pain relief, for pain palliation. Surprisingly, he didn't die in three months. You can see in the fourth pain, 22 months later, he's still alive. The tumor is essentially gone. But most importantly, he had a number of systemic metastatic tumors, which also reduced in size and some disappeared, sending an important signal that focused ultrasound has some immunotherapeutic effect. This is a young boy who was treated at Stanford for something called a desmoid tumor. These are benign, but very aggressively growing tumors that are very difficult or impossible to remove surgically because they're wrapped around the nerves and blood vessels and tendons and ligaments. And not infrequently, these kids end up with amputations to save their lives. He was treated with focused ultrasound as an outpatient. And when and if the tumor recurs, he can be retreated. This is an MR scan of a young woman with breast cancer. She was offered a surgical lumpectomy, the standard of care, but she didn't want an incision or a dimple in her breast. So she chose focused ultrasound, again, an outpatient procedure. In essence, nothing more than a non-invasive lumpectomy. 
this is a seven-year-old girl in London who was struggling with incapacitating, intractable abdominal pain and renal failure from this enormous benign tumor that was filling her pelvis. She was operated upon, but the surgeons had to abort the procedure and back out because the tumor was too bloody. As a last resort, on a purely experimental, one-off basis, she was treated with focused ultrasound. And it took about four hours to destroy approximately 60% of the tumor. In two days, her pain improved. In two weeks, her renal function returned to normal. And she came back six months later, and the majority of the remainder of the tumor was treated with focused ultrasound. And she can come back and be treated repetitively as she grows up. The way it works is analogous to using a magnifying glass to focus beams of light on a point and burn a hole in a leaf. With focused ultrasound, instead of beams of light, multiple beams of ultrasound energy are focused on targets deep in the body with a high degree of precision and accuracy, sparing the adjacent normal tissue, where each of the beams passes through the tissue, it has no effect. But at that point where they aggregate, at that focal point, we now understand 18 ways in which ultrasound interacts with tissue. On the left here, we see a microscopic slide of the liver and on the right, the brain. Note the scale at the bottom of the slide. The margin between what's treated and untreated with focused ultrasound is approximately a tenth of a millimeter, which is infinitely sharper than can be achieved with radiation, and in fact, sharper than can be achieved with the scalpel. And again, at that focal point, we now understand 18 ways in which ultrasound affects tissue. Ten years ago, we understood only three. The fact that there are so many different ways in which ultrasound affects tissue creates the opportunity to treat a broad spectrum of medical disorders, in contrast to radiation, which only has one mechanism of action. One way that focused ultrasound affects tissue is to destroy it. And there's a number of ways that that can be done. One is just to heat the focal point, basically to cook the tissue. Another is to use the mechanical energy of the ultrasound to create micro shock waves that disrupt the cell membranes without raising the temperature. Something that has enormous potential for the future is to use focused ultrasound to deliver drugs and other therapeutic agents in extremely high concentrations, precisely to the point in the body where the drugs are needed, and sparing the systemic side effects or toxicity. And there are a number of ways that this can be done. An example is to use microbubbles. These are hollow lipid spheres, approximately a tenth of a diameter of red blood cell. And these microbubbles can be loaded up with drugs, chemotherapy agents for cancer, genes or growth factors for Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease. And then millions and millions of the microbubbles are injected intravenously into the bloodstream. And they travel to every tissue and every organ. Wherever the blood goes, the microbubbles go. But the drug is inactive because it's trapped in the microbubble, except at the point where the ultrasound is focused. And at that point, and at that point only, the microbubbles burst and release their pharmacological payload. Opening the blood-brain barrier, really important. 
the blood vessels in the brain are different than the blood vessels in the rest of the body in that the inside of the blood vessel is coated by a single layer of highly specialized cells that exist to prevent toxins and bacteria and viruses from getting into the brain. But unfortunately, the blood-brain barrier also keeps drugs, chemotherapy agents for brain tumors, uh, other drugs for Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease from getting into the brain in adequate concentrations. Focused ultrasound, as you can see on the right, that white rectangle, can be used in a very targeted focal manner to reversibly, reversibly, four to six hours, reversibly open the blood-brain barrier, and it can be done repetitively and safely, allowing access to the brain of these important drugs. And then immunomodulation. Focused ultrasound has a really important role to play in the field of immuno-oncology. You've been hearing a lot about the miraculous new cancer immunotherapy drugs like Keytruda that cure Jimmy Carter of his metastatic melanoma to liver, brain, and lung. Well, well fo focused ultrasound works in this manner. When cancer cells aggregate and form a tumor, they have a way of camouflaging themselves from the body's immune system. Focused ultrasound strips away that camouflage, allows the body's immune system to attack the tumor, but also augments or enhances the effectiveness of the cancer immunotherapy drugs. Now the point in the body where the ultrasound is focused and targeted and guided and controlled is by either MR imaging in this case or ultrasound imaging. So here we have an MR of a patient's brain showing a metastatic tumor. The tumor is targeted, the treatment is planned, and the magic is that you can actually watch the effect on the tissue as the treatment is being administered. Unlike radiation, where the effect of the therapy is invisible while the treatment is being administered, and it takes weeks or months for the effect of radiation to become apparent, the effect of focused ultrasound is immediate and verifiable. So this complicated slide has two important points. The first is the large number of clinical indications or disorders that are in various stages of research and development and commercialization around the world. And today, there are more than 130 indications in various stages of development. 10 years ago, there were only three. So the field is expanding rapidly. And the second point is you can see that most of these indications are in early stages of development. Around the world today, only about a 30 of the 130 have regulatory approval. And in the US, five or six are approved by the FDA. And two or three have any type of insurance reimbursement. And this is just a manifestation of the fact that the field is still young and growing and that there's a lot of work and a lot of money that has to be spent in order to bring these indications across the finish line. Now, when you see 130 indications, it sort of strains credibility. It sounds too good to be true, like snake oil, good for whatever ails you. But to be sure, focused ultrasound is not a silver bullet. It is not a, not a panacea. It's not for every patient, and it's not for every disorder. And more work needs to be done in order to define where focused ultrasound will provide unique value in the therapeutic armamentarium. 
because of the potential impact of this amazing technology on so many patients, there's a lot of impetus to make it available widely in the shortest time possible. Because every month that transpires where the technology is not available translates into unnecessary death and disability and suffering for countless individuals. The problem is that the evolution of any new highly disruptive therapeutic technology from idea and laboratory research to widespread utilization as a standard of care is a glacial process that often takes decades. The first patient was treated with a gamma knife in 1950, and the gamma knife didn't become a mainstream therapy until 1995. The first patient with prostate cancer was treated in a clinical trial using focused ultrasound in 1985. It wasn't approved by the FDA until 2015, and reimbursement didn't begin until this year, 2020. And the reason is that the process is extraordinarily complicated and requires a large number of very difficult steps that have to be achieved by a bewildering array of organizations that have different agendas and different timelines for decision making, and many of which have to interact with each other. And in addition, there's a fairly daunting litany of impediments, lack of awareness amongst patients and their physicians of the potential of focused ultrasound, long-term rigorous scientific evidence of feasibility and safety and efficacy and cost benefit. Regulatory approvals are time consuming. Insurance reimbursement is very difficult to achieve. Physicians as a segment of society are amongst the slowest to adopt new, to change and adopt new technologies. And fairly vicious turf battles that develop between the different medical specialists and the manufacturers of legacy therapy equipment like radiation therapy or surgical robotic and the new focused ultrasound technology. So when we got involved with this field, we cast about for a playbook or a model that we could follow that would shorten the time from laboratory research to widespread patient utilization. But we couldn't find one, so we were oblig obliged to invent one. And that was the genesis of the Focus Ultrasound Foundation. So the foundation is a unique medical research, education, and advocacy organization that was founded in October 2006 as a 501c3 tax-exempt organization. Although we are not venture-backed, obviously, we operate entirely as a venture-backed entrepreneurial, high-impact, high-performance, high-technology service organization in the private sector. We're based in Charlottesville, Virginia, but we have a global influence with people in Europe working for us as well as in Asia. Charity Navigator has recognized the foundation as being one of the top 10 medical research organizations in America. And the Darden Business School and the Batten School of Public Policy and Leadership at UVA teamed up and wrote a case on the foundation as an exemplar of a social entrepreneurship organization. Our mission is very simple, to accelerate the development and adoption of focused ultrasound. Our strategic focus is all about the patients the litmus test of every dollar we spend and every action we take is will it help patients. On a quarterly basis, we look at the critical path from laboratory research to widespread utilization and identify 
the choke points or the barriers to adoption. And then we deploy resources where we have adequate resources to do a good job. We positioned the foundation at the center of this complicated ecosystem where we interact with essentially all of the stakeholders. We operate catalytically. We're fighting a guerrilla war, not a big pitched battle. Accordingly, the organization is lean and we leverage both human resources and financial resources. And we operate with an absolutely obsessive sense of urgency, saving time, saving lives. And as time goes on, we're trying to engage as many related organizations, the disease specific foundations, NIH, the manufacturers, venture capital, and so on, to assume as many of the functions of the foundation as possible so that over time we can diminish in, in size and stature. And the ultimate measure of our success will be 15 years from now when we are no longer needed. We are not creating an endowment. We do not want to become a self-sustaining bureaucracy like the March of Dimes. We have become the guiding light or the compass for the entire field. We spend a lot of time and money and energy breaking down silos of secrecy to stimulate innovation. One of our major activities is research. We organize and conduct and fund research. About 65% of our budget is for research. We're interested ecumenically in all of those 130 plus indications, but where we concentrate our team's attention are on the brain indications, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, OCD and depression, stroke and epilepsy, and brain tumors, and cancer and cancer immunotherapy, particularly glioblastoma, pancreatic cancer, breast cancer, and melanoma, and in that regard, we have formal partnerships with the Cancer Research Institute in New York and the Parker Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy. And then a year ago or so, we started a veterinary program based on the idea that the technology is developed and tested in animal models of human disease, and then it is used in humans. But heretofore, it has not been used to treat animals with naturally occurring disorders. So we started this program to treat animals like this dog that was scheduled to have half of its mandible removed for this oral melanoma, but instead was treated with focused ultrasound. So we're treating these, these companion animals and we're studying them and creating a virtuous cycle now of animals helping humans, helping animals, helping humans. We have a fellowship program where we bring mid-career clinicians and scientists to work with us in Charlottesville for a year or two. And then they go back to their home institution where we've created a sound platform for collaboration. We have two internship programs. One, we twin 20 of the leading focused ultrasound investigators around the world with young high school or college students for the summer. And then we have a year round program here in our offices in Charlottesville. Our website is widely recognized as the encyclopedia of focused ultrasound, the most comprehensive and trusted and up to date source of information. On a fairly regular basis, we have webinars, uh, for instance, cancer immunotherapy and focused ultrasound or psychiatric disorders and focused ultrasound. And our newsletter has a circulation of about 32,000 and it comes out bi-monthly. And if you're not receiving it, we suggest you go to the website and sign up. And then the usual social media channels. Every two years in the DC area, we host the largest and most important meeting about focused ultrasound. 
The next one is, is in November of 2020, right after the election. A year ago in October, we had 450 some people from 23 countries and 250 presentations. During the year, we host several invitation only small meetings. These are workshops where we bring together clinicians and scientists and physicists and business people from industry and academia and NIH and FDA. And we bring them together for a day or a day and a half with the intent to create a roadmap of technology development, preclinical laboratory studies and clinical trials that will lead to the creation of a new clinical indication in the shortest time possible. A year ago in February, we had one on pancreatic cancer, for instance. And this last July, we had our third uh, workshop summit on cancer immunotherapy in conjunction with the Cancer Research Institute. We've created several centers of excellence around the world. These are luminary sites that showcase the technology and serve as venues for collaboration. We'll create three, three more this year, one in the UK, one in Asia, and another one in the US. Now, essential for advancing the field is to be certain that all of the stakeholders are aware of the potential of focused ultrasound. So we engage in a variety of activities. We go to awareness events, whether it's TEDx or the Consumer Electronics Show, 180,000 people, or the Milken Global Conference, uh, 4,500 people. We have a very aggressive media placement program, print, broadcast, and digital. John Grisham, one of our directors, several years ago, had the absolutely brilliant idea that he could use his brand and his storytelling ability to increase the awareness of all of the stakeholders in one fell swoop by writing a short book, 44 pages. And he did this, and he's written and had said on numerous occasions that this is the most important book he's ever written because it's all about saving lives. And you can see the impact it's had on our website traffic. More than a million people have looked at this book to date, and it's available for free on Amazon and Google and so on. And you can contact us for a print version of it as well. Now, the evolution of a new disruptive therapeutic technology from idea to widespread utilization as a standard of care occurs exponentially. And today we are just beyond the inflection point of the curve. And the dialogue has shifted from if focused ultrasound is gonna have a real role to play in therapy to when, from if to when, and of course, our job is to make when now. But more importantly, we're now transitioning from what's been historically almost exclusively a research environment to the beginning of a commercial patient treatment environment, from science to sales. Accordingly, we work with the manufacturers because in order for our vision of millions of patients to be affected by focused ultrasound, the predicate is that there has to be successful organizations, commercial organizations, to manufacture and distribute the technology. So we work with the manufacturers and we work with the FDA. We work with the FDA to help them become a bridge rather than a barrier to the adoption of the technology. And the FDA very much likes working with us because they view us as a trusted, independent, unbiased third party 
in contrast to the investigators on one hand and the manufacturers on the other hand that have a different agenda. And we partner with the manufacturers to help them get reimbursement from the government, from Medicare, as well as from commercial insurance companies. And that is very much a work in progress. And then we have a FUS Partners initiative where we help the manufacturers who are in need of financing access capital. We help the manufacturers create strategic relationships with other companies. And we help the manufacturers achieve technology transfer from academic institutions. To execute our strategy, we have created an amazing team of 35 plus individuals, including six MDs, six PhDs, four or five MBAs. All of the team members are athletes being a small organization. They have to be able to play more than one position. They're all A players. It's an all-star team. We've built the organization with the philosophy that A's attract A's and B's attract C's. And as a result of a rather draconian ongoing reconstructive pruning process, I'm happy to tell you that the foundation is populated entirely by A players as of today. Regarding the pandemic, everyone at the foundation is working from home. Amazingly, the effectiveness of the organization is about 80% and improving as people adjust to the new paradigm. Most importantly, all of our team members and their families are healthy. They all operate under the idea that working for the foundation is a privilege. The opportunity to improve the lives of millions of people is a privilege. But more importantly, every one of us believes in our core values that the highest calling or purpose in life is to help other people. Accordingly, 10 days ago, we implemented on a purely voluntary basis, a tithing program where we asked everyone to contribute at least 5% of their take home pay for the next two months to help people who are less fortunate, help individuals and small businesses. And 100% of the team has signed up for this program. The board of directors is amazing. Despite the fact that there are a number of very high profile individuals, it is not at all a letterhead or a marquee board. It is not a typical philanthropic board. No one is obliged to donate to be on this board and no one expects to achieve any recognition. There is no social cachet for being involved with this board. It is truly a corporate governance board that represents the interests of the stakeholders. And I encourage you to the, go to the website and look at the bio sketches of these individuals. This board could go toe to toe with any Fortune 50 company. And then we have another organization co-chaired by Jane Batten and Charlie Salheimer which in essence is our goodwill SWAT team. And these introduce us to individuals of influence who can go out and help spread the word about Focus Ultrasound. And they into introduce us to individuals of substance who can help support the foundation. Our budget this year is about $13 million. We have to raise $13 million of which 65% is budgeted for research. In the aggregate, we have had contributed more than $125 million from an amazing group of donors, 
and its money's come in tranches from three dollars to more than 20 million dollars and our donors are willing to share not only their money but their minds with us they become our partners we are exquisitely sensitive to the fact that we operate with other people's money accordingly we try and leverage that as much as possible for instance we agreed to fund a clinical trial of Alzheimer's disease in Canada that had a budget of a million eight. And we hunted around and found a Canadian foundation that helped us by contributing a million five. We don't pay any indirect costs to the academic institutions. And in terms of follow on funding for every research project that we have funded, that has been completed, where we invested one dollar, those organizations have been able to achieve an amazing eight dollars in follow-on funding, mostly from NIH, but also from other foundations. So we can assume if the foundation never existed, if we didn't exist, we can posit that by 2035, in 15 years, focused ultrasound will be fully, fully mature and a million people will be treated each year around the world. So all we're doing is investing money in a variety of activities that overcome barriers and shift the adoption curve to the left, saving time, saving lives. When I first heard I had Parkinson's, I was very surprised. I always thought of it being an older person's illness and I've always seen people in wheelchairs. So I thought I was gonna lose all my mobility. Uh, basically anything that required movement, I couldn't do it. My leg would bounce uncontrollably. It would hyperextend and actually lock backwards. It was very, very painful. I couldn't walk, so I had to be taken in, in a wheelchair to the hospital. With each treatment, I could feel myself getting stronger and stronger. My symptoms were getting less and less, and my pain was getting less. Then the uh, clinical trial director, she looked at me and she says, get up, you can walk. And I thought, I can walk. It was amazing. I got there in the wheelchair, unable to walk, and immediately following it, I walked to the room. It was a miracle. The Focus ultrasound treatment has given me back my life. I've been able to go on walks. I've been able to run, being able to ride my bike again. It was a miracle. So at the end of the day, what we do is we take money and we use it to make focused ultrasound, which as you've seen, results in a mir miracles that transforms disease into health and happiness for millions of people around the world. Now I can say with absolute confidence that sooner or later, every one of you who's listening to this presentation or a loved one or a friend is going to develop a disorder that could be treated with focused ultrasound. Think about it. Thank you, Neil. Um, and now we have um, several questions that have come in, um, but I'd like to encourage everyone online, there's still time to submit your your questions if you have them for Dr. Cassell. So we'll start, there's a few questions around clinical, the clinical applications of focused ultrasound. So first, Neil, if you could just say what um, diseases that focused ultrasound has been approved for, I assume in FDA approval, um, and then ones where there are key uh, ones where there are clinical trials. So it's been approved in the U.S. for uterine fibroids, prostate cancer and prostate tissue treatment, pain from bone metastasis, essential tremor and tremor from related to Parkinson's disease. And the most exciting clinical trials right now are related to Alzheimer's disease and cancer immunotherapy. Great. Um, and then further along the lines, um, specifically for Parkinson's disease, 
Um, in terms of early clinical data, uh, how long lasting is the tremor relief for someone who has Parkinson's tremor and how many treatments might be typical? Thus far, patients are only receiving one treatment the assumption is that if the tremor returns, they can be retreated because this is a non-invasive therapy. And the durability of the focused ultrasound treatment in alleviating the tremor in both essential tremor and Parkinson's disease is really good. It's in terms of many years. Of course, Parkinson's disease is a progressive disease, and it's anticipated eventually the symptoms will worsen. And what about treating both sides of the brain for patients with, with tremor? Is that something that is going on right now? Yeah, those clinical trials have just started and we anticipate that, that it'll be positive. Okay, several more about um, specific Clinical trials, uh, are there trials for pancreatic cancer? I know the answer to that is yes. Um, and then what is the status for lung cancer? So we used to say that it was impossible to treat tumors of the lung because air is an insulator for ultrasound. But we funded a study in Germany where they filled the lung up with water and enable the tumors to be treated. So there are clinical, there are preclinical laboratory studies ongoing today, and it's hoped that within the next two years, lung tumors will be treated routinely in clinical trials. Right now it's being treated, they're being treated on an anecdotal basis. And in terms of using um, focused ultrasound for delivering drugs into the brain, um, can you talk a little bit more about the status of, of that in terms of trials? So the, the, there's two ways to deliver drugs to the brain. One is to open the blood brain barrier. And the initial feasibility and safety studies of opening the blood-brain barrier for Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, ALS, and brain tumors have, have already occurred. Those are ongoing. And the next step is to start to deliver drugs once we've proven that you can safely open the blood-brain barrier. Those trials are ongoing, just starting now. And in terms of, then there's other ways of delivering drugs to the brain using the microbubbles or nanoparticles, those are still in the preclinical or laboratory stage. Okay. And in general, how do patients get into the clinical trials, whether it's Alzheimer's or something else, how do they find out about them and get into the trials? They can ask their uh, physicians who probably have never heard of focused ultrasound. They can go to the foundation's website and look at the specific indication, whether it's Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or pancreatic cancer. And then there's a website called clinicaltrials.gov, which shows the status of every clinical trial ongoing around the world. And lastly, they can email or call us and we can help them navigate the system. Okay. Um, and, and then there's a, some questions around uh, reimbursement of focused ultrasound treatments. Can you talk a little bit about the status there and what needs to be done and maybe even how, how others can, can, be, uh, can partner with the foundation to help? So uh, on a, by the end of this month, I think, on a nationwide basis, essential tremor will be covered by Medicare, which is important because most of the patients with essential tremor are the Medicare aid age. Uh, commercial, there are some commercial insurance companies that are paying for uh, bone metastasis, pain from bone metastasis. Uh, some are paying for, um, pay for prostate cancer. 
but in general, the reimbursement landscape is pretty sparse right now, but that's just because it takes time. Okay. Um, what is, there was a question around um, what's going on in, in other countries, both, um, are there one of our own, uh, do we have any partnerships in the UK and then another kind of around what's gone on in Asia and how has the success there um, been instrumental for approving things in the US? So there's, there's a lot of activity in Asia, everything from prostate cancer, uterine fibroids, pain from bone metastasis, Parkinson's disease, essential tremor, and so on. And you can see that activity on the website. One of the epicenters for the development of focused ultrasound was in China, at Chongqing. So there's a tremendous amount of activity in Asia, a lot in China, a lot in Korea, a lot in Japan, in Taiwan, and Singapore, and so on. So of all of the, the, the today there are about seven or 800 commercial treatment sites about a hundred plus are in the US and the others are evenly divided between Asia and Europe and the UK. Okay, we had um, a question kind of a little bit more about what happens to the, the tissue when the focused ultrasound, specifically tumor tissue, when the focused ultrasound destroys the tissue, then what happens to that tissue and, and does it uh, cause a risk of cancer metastasis anywhere else in the body? It absolutely does not cause a risk of metastasis because all of the tumor cells are dead. And what happens to those dead cells is the body's uh, uh, system over time the scavenges it and the, body, and the, and the, the, the tumor is basically absorbed. So um, we have some questions around um, the manufacturers, kind of the commercial space, um, as well as kind of how to uh, get beyond the, the burden of this being a high cost um, technology and sort of, you know, charting the path forward, given that it is a high cost um, recommendations in that sense. Okay, so there's two questions. First of all, today there are 55 manufacturers of focused ultrasound equipment around the world. Ten years ago there were only five. All of these companies companies are small. None have more than about 50 million dollars in revenue. And a number of them are currently seeking financing. And that again is just a manifestation of the fact that the field is young and we anticipate that the number of manufacturers will grow to 60 or 70 and then there will be a consolidation into between four and eight major companies. And this is analogous to what happened in the MR imaging space 35 years ago, there were several dozen companies and then it consolidated into GE, Philips and Siemens and three or so uh, niche players, smaller companies. So that's, that, that's what we see happening. We, we believe that in the next several years, a number of these companies will grow and become successful and then there will be a consolidation and we're in a position, of course, to facilitate that. And what was the second part of the question? The second part was around the kind of high cost of the um, around the high cost of the technology, and is that a um, is that a barrier to kind of getting research started and getting um, things moving? Okay. Well, the cost of the technology today is of the same order of magnitude as other high end therapy devices, whether it's radiation therapy or surgical robotics. And it's any place from $400,000 to 
for a device to $3 million. But the important point and, and the cost of that equipment will decrease rapidly over time. But more importantly, even today, Focused ultrasound represents one of the rare technologies that fulfills the holy grail of both decreasing the cost of care while improving outcome. And a couple of data points. A hysterectomy for uterine fibroids, all in surgeon and hospital, is twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars. A focused ultrasound treatment is five to ten thousand dollars. The standard of care for treating Parkinson's disease today is deep brain stimulation. That's sixty to one hundred thousand dollars year one, and then there's downstream costs. Focused ultrasound is thirty to forty thousand dollars. So it's 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 an important point. This is a, a really unusual type of technology. And then there are some questions around um, the risks of injury or side effects with focused ultrasound. If you could comment on that, so it's it's a uh, it's a it's a it's a risky uh, technology because if you put that focal point in the wrong spot, it will create a, a complication. Just like if you put a knife in the wrong spot. Having said that. In all the published literature to date, when you compare focused ultrasound with other invasive or minimally invasive approaches, the safety profile is favorably favorable and the efficacy profile is equivalent or superior. Can you comment um, in the veterinary space? Um, do you do you what do you think is an exciting application or exciting applications for using focused ultrasound in the veterinary space besides oncology? Actually, well, so it's, it's the it's treating uh, the variety of soft tissue tumors, uh, treating the pain from arthritis, I think is important, and its potential. You know, it hasn't been done widely yet but a spay-neuter application. Okay. Can you comment on um, pediatric applications, um, specifically uh, brain tumors and really, you know, using this for pediatrics with the hopes of avoiding radiation therapy? So this has been used now in, uh, the pediatric uh, space is very important because you don't like to radiate children because they live for a long time and they've developed secondary cancers. So desmoid tumors, sarcomas, uh, osteoid, uh, osteoma, those, small, those bone tumors. And this year, uh, uh, there will be studies of brain tumors as well in the pediatric population. Can you comment on the intersection of focus ultrasound with stem cell therapies? Is this something that's uh, occurring? Yeah, so there's two approaches. One is using focused ultrasound to open the blood-brain barrier to get stem cells into the brain for treating either ALS or Parkinson's disease. And then there's an idea of using uh, stem, something called stem cell homing, where, for instance, uh, you can treat an area of the body where you want the stem cells to go, and you treat it with focused ultrasound and the stem cells will migrate to that point. Uh, in terms of um, immunomodulation, uh, do, you, do you have any indication whether thermal ablation or hysterotripsy is better in terms of inducing the immune response? Our suspicion is that hysterotripsy may be superior, but one of the burning questions which the foundation is addressing is what modality of focused ultrasound is most immunogenic and does that vary from tumor? So we are doing, as we speak, we are doing comparative studies of radiation, thermal ablation, moderate hyperthermia, cavitation, 
boiling histotripsy and the Michigan flavor of histotripsy. And we hope with, by the end of the year to have the answer to that question. Great. Well, unfortunately, we've come to the end of our time and we did have several questions that we weren't able to get to. So I want to encourage um, all of you to, if your question wasn't answered, to visit us, um, visit our website and you can contact us and we can also try to get in touch with you to answer as many of these questions that unfortunately we didn't have the time to answer. Um, but Otherwise, this concludes today's webinar, and we thank you all for joining us, and please stay tuned to our newsletter and website for invitations to future webinars. Thank you.